Hey guys, welcome back, and I'm so glad to have you here with me on the dark side. Today we're talking about the Yuba County Five out of California. Five friends go missing after a fun night watching their favorite college basketball team. What happened that night would turn into a decades-long mystery, one that has been told in books, there's been documentaries, and even movies based on this story. My sources are in the description area. I know there's been a lot of inaccuracies over the years. Being that this case is 46 years old, sometimes the details get muddied, so I tried to piece it together the best I could. This is episode 110, The Case of the Yuba County Five. This story took place in Yuba County, California in 1978. Ted Bundy was finally captured. The average house was $54,000 and the average yearly salary was $17,000. The film Halloween was released in theaters and it's still one of my favorites of all time. The video game Space Invaders was developed in Japan. Jimmy Carter was president. California voters approved Proposition 13, which slashed property taxes by nearly 60%. And lastly, our favorite orange cat, Garfield, made his debut in the form of a comic strip and has won the hearts of so many people in the world. The Yuba County Five are a group of very close friends. They are known to their families as the boys, so you'll hear me refer to them as the boys quite a bit. These five men all had developmental disabilities. They are high functioning though. For example, one of the men is 24 years old. His family says he had the mind of a 15 or 16 year old. They were all able to be productive members of society even with limited mental abilities. They can work jobs and one of them can drive a car. They're all very sweet boys and they've never been in any kind of trouble. They all still live at home with their families and the way that they met was through the Gateway Center for the Handicapped. It's super important to keep in mind throughout the story the innocence in each one of them. Even though these men are in their 20s and 30s, their minds are that of someone much younger. Let's go over who these men are. Jack Madruga is 30 years old. He is a Vietnam veteran. With his money he got from the military, he bought his dream car, a 1969 Mercury Montego. This car is part of the case, and we'll talk more about it later. Jack took really good care of this car and was always washing it. He loves basketball, just like the others in his group. He loves baseball, and according to Strange Outdoors, Jack was never officially diagnosed as having developmental delays, but his family said he had a low IQ and described him as slow. Since he didn't have an official diagnosis, he was able to serve in the Army and get a driver's license. He loves I Love Lucy, and his favorite music is Diana Ross and the Supremes. Gary Mathias is 25 years old. Gary is the newest member of their group of friends, and not exactly like the others. He does not have any developmental delays, but he has an official diagnosis of schizophrenia. His schizophrenia was severe. When untreated, he suffered with hallucinations, paranoia, outbursts, and psychosis. However, Gary had been prescribed medication which controlled his symptoms, and he was fine as long as he's taking it. Gary did have some run-ins with the law, which could have been due to his schizophrenia, because he seemed to be doing well since being prescribed antipsychotics and was happy to have four new friends who accepted him with his history. At the time of this story, Gary is visiting his psychologist every two weeks and heavily medicated to prevent his schizophrenia from emerging. He's had zero issues for the last two years. You would never know he had this illness and it was almost like it was dormant inside. Ted Ware is the oldest of the group of friends. Ted is 32 years old. He, his family said he's always been developmentally delayed since he was born. He had previously worked as a janitor at a school, and then he worked as a cashier, but quit because he wasn't fast enough to keep up. Ted is known to be kind, friendly, and afraid of the dark. He also has a poor sense of direction. One instance with Ted was that his family's house had caught fire. They woke him up and told him, get up, there's a fire, run. He wanted to keep on sleeping. He didn't understand the urgency and why he needed to leave his bed. Ted was known to run and hide if he felt scared or nervous. 
He was also known to wave at strangers and would be upset if they didn't wave back and he would think that they were mad at him or that he did something wrong. Jackie Hewitt is the youngest member at 24 years old. He has the most severe developmental disability. When Jackie was born, his parents were informed by the doctor that their son was retarded. I know that's an outdated term and I feel weird using it, but that's what his parents were told. Growing up, he couldn't read or write. He seemed to have the most difficulty out of all of the boys. Jackie's best friend is Ted, the man I talked about a moment ago. Jackie was known to look out for Ted and help him with any tasks he needed help with and vice versa. And lastly, Bill Sterling is 29 years old. Bill was deeply religious. He loved to read and going to the library. He had spent time in two mental institutions, and back then they were called insane asylums. He is part of a special needs bowling team and loved to walk for miles. He was known to have violent outbursts, but only when provoked. For example, he was being harassed by someone at the institution, so he lashed out. But Bill wasn't known to go around starting trouble. He is known to be social and intelligent. The way this group met was they all played on a basketball team together. They are on the Gateway Gators. The Gateway Gators are part of the Gateway Center for the Handicapped. They have an upcoming basketball game, and this one is super important because it's the playoffs for the Special Olympics. All five men were so excited about this game. They even had their uniforms laid out on their beds, and Ted had asked his mom to clean his sneakers and make sure they were bright white. If they won this game, they would proceed to the Special Olympics and get a week-long trip to Disneyland. But the night before the big playoff game, this is February 24, 1978, the five friends decided that they were going to pile into Jack's car and head up the road to see a college basketball game. Their favorite team was playing that night. UC Davis was playing Chico State, and they didn't want to miss it. Their families weren't crazy about the five of them heading out this night. They have this huge game tomorrow, and they're supposed to meet up for at Montgomery Wards at 8 a.m., and they all need to be ready. The game they want to watch tonight is 55 miles away. Each one is given instructions by their families. Be safe, don't wander off, stick together, and so on. Jack is driving, so they all get into his car, which is his favorite thing he owns, and off they go. They have a good time at the game, and afterwards they leave together excited that their team they were rooting for won the game. It's so insane to me that the next set of events is a mystery that has been unsolved for almost 50 years. According to Cynthia Gorney for the Washington Post, the following morning, Ted's mother, Imogene, woke up early around 5 a.m. with an uneasy feeling. She went to bed last night, and Ted still wasn't home, but she knows the game let out late. They had a long drive and possibly stopped to eat or whatever. But she can't shake the feeling that something is wrong. The only way that she can verify this is to get out of bed and walk over to Ted's bedroom. She is horrified when she opens the door and sees that his bed is still made. His basketball jersey is laid out on the bed since he was excited for the game and wanted to make sure his uniform was ready. Ted never came home last night. She got on the phone and called Bill Sterling's mother, who said she's been awake since 2 a.m. and Bill hasn't come home either. She also said that she talked to Jack's mother and he hasn't come home. Imogene called Jackie's mother and he hasn't come home. She sent her daughter-in-law down the street to talk to Gary's stepfather, and he said Gary hadn't returned either last night. All five families wait around throughout the day, hoping every car that comes down the street is their boys. But the hours pass and none have returned. That basketball game they were all excited to participate in has passed. And by 8 o'clock p.m., they called police and reported them missing. At first, police aren't too worried when they learn the boys were between 24 and 32. They're probably just partying out of town and celebrating the win. But when the families explain that they have developmental disabilities, telling them they're basically teenagers, except Jackie and Ted, who are more childlike, then the police take their concerns more seriously and a real search begins. The families are super concerned because these men wouldn't do well in a stressful environment their conditions will deteriorate. Remember, Ted was afraid of the dark. 
Jack hates the cold. Bill hates snow. All five have very strict regimens and schedules, and it's rare that they venture far from home. They learn that they did, in fact, go to the game. Their team won, so I know they were all excited. Afterwards, they stopped at Bear's Market. The clerk, Mary Davis, remembered them well because it was 10 o'clock p.m. and she was closing the store. This car full of five men pulls in as she's closing up, and she was annoyed having customers at the last second. But she said they all seemed polite, and they bought candy bars, a quart of milk, Pepsis, a lemon pastry, and just basically a bunch of junk food. Then they got back in their car, went on their way, and she closed the store up. This was the last official sighting of the boys. On Tuesday, February 28th, this is four days since they were last seen. A police dispatcher in another county contacts the Yuba County Sheriff's Department. The dispatcher tells them that a forest worker was out marking timber and came across a teal and white Mercury Montego that was abandoned. This forest worker didn't think much of it because he thought someone was just parking there to get out and hike for the day. But when he saw it was still there the next day, he contacted the sheriff's department. Let's discuss this area that the car was found in. So when they left the basketball game in Chico, instead of heading back to Yuba City, which is a straight shot, they instead drove 70 miles in the wrong direction, an hour and 15 minutes away. It is way up in the mountains of the Plumas National Forest in the Sierra Nevada Mountains. It is sitting on an unpaved road. And just so you guys can picture this scene, it's snowing hard. It's below freezing with 12 to 15 foot snow drifts. This is an area that gets tons of snow every winter. When the boys left Yuma County, they were wearing lightweight coats and sneakers. So they are not dressed for below freezing temperatures and hiking through feet of snow. According to Strange Outdoors, the car would have had to travel using the Oroville Quincy Highway from Oroville off Highway 70. Jack would have had to drive through Oroville, cross the Bidwell Bar Bridge, and drive up a winding, unmarked road. It would have been really clear that this was the completely wrong way to go. The car was operable and contained a quarter tank of gas. It was unlocked and the keys are missing. The odd thing was to get to where they're at would likely cause damage to the underside of the car. They have to go over tree branches and holes and it's snowing and dark and they're in the middle of nowhere climbing this unpaved mountain road. But police found no indication of any damage to the bottom of the car, even with five men riding in it, making it much heavier. Another thing was that this car was stuck in the snow, but could have easily gotten out. With all five men pushing, it would take no time. These are strong, athletic men, but they didn't push the car for some reason. Inside the car, candy bar wrappers, empty Pepsi bottles, Hostess cake wrappers are scattered around. They also found maps in the glove compartment. The police hotwire the car, and it starts right up, and they get it out of its spot. There was nothing mechanically wrong with the car. So, to reiterate, they were supposed to leave the game in Chico and come home. Instead, they stopped at a convenience store, then went 70 miles in the opposite direction. They end up in Pluma's National Forest at night. There's no lighting except their headlights. They go up the winding mountain road in a blizzard, get the car stuck, but it's capable of being moved, and now they are missing. This is strange because none of these men are the type to do something like this. They had strict schedules and routines that they stuck to. They have to be home by a certain time. They don't really have the freedom to pull something like this off. If they were 20-year-old boys having a night of partying and drinking, I could see something like this. But these guys are different. They do not break rules or do wild, spontaneous things. They don't know the area. They aren't dressed for the snow. Again, they left in lightweight coats and sneakers. Ted's mom even told him that he needed his winter coat, but he said no since he would just be sitting in a gymnasium. It's dark, blizzard conditions. Jack's prized car is abandoned. Why did they drive so far in the wrong direction? Why did they leave the car to get out and trudge through snow in the middle of nowhere in sneakers? Jack knew the route home as he had driven that route before. 
in order to get to where they were, were found, he had to drive over bridges. And there's a sign that says, welcome to Pluma's National Forest. He 100% had to know that he was going the wrong way. And then to end up on this unpaved road high up on a mountain is just bizarre. According to a writer for The Human Exception, Lieutenant Lance Ayers of the Yuba County Sheriff's Office puts out a, nation, a nationwide bulletin about the missing boys. In a 1978 article from the Reno Gazette Journal, it reads, and I apologize for the first line, Five slightly retarded men who vanished without a trace more than a week ago are the objects of an intensive hunt in a snowy wilderness rated as some of the roughest in the California. We don't know what happened to them. We've got a real mystery on our hands, declared Yuba County Under Sheriff Jack Beecham, who said multiple murder is one possible explanation. If the missing men became confused and wandered into the forest, not much hope is held for their survival, said Sheriff Jim Grant. I was up there myself one day, and the only way I could get out was with a compass. So one woman comes forward and says that she saw the boys get out of a red truck at a store the day after they disappeared. It was around 2 p.m. in the afternoon. She said two of them went into the store, two stayed in the truck, and one got out to use the payphone. This eyewitness wasn't totally discredited, but there's a possibility that she could be mistaken. For example, the one she says was at the payphone was Jackie. Jackie is known not to make phone calls by himself. He always needs assistance from someone else. Jackie could help the others use the phone, but struggled with making phone calls himself. But someone else claims he saw the boys, and police are paying much closer attention to this guy. According to an article from the LA Times written in 1978, a man by the name of Joseph Shans says he saw the boys the night they disappeared. This was around 11 p.m. to midnight, over an hour after they left the store and bought snacks. Joseph Sean says he was heading back from checking on his cabin in the Plumas National Forest. There is a ton of snow, and he wants to make sure the roof hasn't caved in or whatever on his old cabin. He says he got his car stuck on an unpaved road. There's too much snow, and his tires are spinning, so he gets out and tries to, to push the car by hand. While doing this, he ended up suffering a heart attack. So he gets back in his car and tries to wait it out. He climbs in his back seat and lays down. The car is running so the heat would blast and he can stay warm. He tells police that he saw a couple sets of headlights behind him about 20 feet. He sees a car and then a pickup truck behind the car. He sees silhouettes of five men, and he also sees what appears to be a woman carrying a baby which he thought was odd because it's so late and this woman has a baby out in the cold. He yells for help and the headlights turn off. He also heard someone whistling. He later saw the boys carrying flashlights, but when he called out again for help, the flashlights went out. Eventually, Joe's car runs out of gas and he has to make a decision. So he decides to take the risk and try to walk down the mountain to get help after just suffering a heart attack. Can you imagine walking eight miles down a mountain in heavy snow at night with no flashlight and you've just had a heart attack? It's a miracle itself that he survived. Joe eventually gets to a hospital. When police interview him, he's kind of questioning his own sanity. He's not sure if he even saw a second car, which was a pickup truck behind the car behind him. He's not sure if the woman holding a baby was real or not. He had just had a heart attack and was in and out of consciousness while laying in the back seat. He knows there was definitely a car behind him, and he saw men getting out of it. The location where Joe says he saw the car was the same location where the Mercury Montego was found. Huge searches are taking place. You've got people on snowmobiles, four-wheelers, there's helicopters in the area. Eventually, in mid-March, the search is called off until spring when the snow melts, although at that point it could be a recovery mission. The families of these men still continue their own searches, and they aren't giving up. The police learned that Gary had friends in Forbestown, which would be on the route between Chico and the Plumas National Forest where the car was found. Is it possible that Gary said, let's stop and visit my friends once we leave the game, and then they got lost and ended up on a mountain. The police find out who these friends are, 
And they say they haven't heard from Gary in over a year, and that he certainly didn't have any plans to come visit them that night. The families are overcome with grief and heartache, wondering where their beloved boys can be. Yes, they are all men in their 20s and 30s, but these are innocent, vulnerable men. Even Gary, who didn't have a disability but suffered with severe schizophrenia, even though it's controlled, he's still considered vulnerable. It's not until four months later, this is June 1978, a major discovery is found. It's springtime and all the snow that was in the area is gone and the weather is pleasant. Some motorcyclists were riding about 20 miles from where Jack's car was found. This is further up in the Palumas National Forest. They come across a forest ranger's trailer. This is a single wide trailer that was used by forest service workers. It contains supplies and stuff like that, but it hadn't been used in a long time. They noticed a window was broken, and the smell coming from inside the trailer was overwhelming. It was making them nauseous. They contact the police, and when they get there, which was a job in itself since they had to clear five fallen trees in the roadway to even get all the way up there, inside that trailer, they find something startling. Laying on a mattress was the deceased body of Ted Ware. He was 32 years old. Ted, remember, was the oldest of the group. He was best friends with the youngest, who was Jackie. Ted was the one who would wave to strangers and get sad if they didn't wave back. Ted was found wrapped in eight sheets, including his head. Someone had wrapped him up after he died. The families believe it was Jackie, his best friend, who did this. He was always helping Ted. None of the other men were there. So Ted is the only one we know for certain made it to the trailer, although there were signs that others had been there, such as Gary Mathias's shoes were left in the trailer. I know you're all wondering why this trailer wasn't found during any of the searches. It was 20 miles further up the road, so it may not have been on their radar. Plus, no one probably thought that the boys were capable of making it that far in a few feet of snow, walking in sneakers and lightweight coats in the dark. We did learn that the day before the boys went missing, a snowcat had been on the road and it went for miles up the mountain and past the Forest Service trailer. So the boys likely followed the path that the snowcat went through so it wasn't difficult to walk through. For any international listeners, when I say snowcat, I'm not referring to an animal. I'm referring to a vehicle with tracks instead of wheels that can go through the snow easily. The scene at the trailer doesn't appear to have any foul play undertones. Ted wasn't stabbed or strangled or appear to be beaten. His cause of death was determined to be a combination of hypothermia and starvation. Ted was around 220 pounds or 99 kilograms when he left for the basketball game. He was also clean shaven. When he was found, his body weighed 120 pounds or 54 kilograms and he had a long beard. The length of his beard helps to determine how long he was alive for. They estimate that he was alive for 8 to 13 weeks after he went missing. His beard continued to grow for those 8 to 13 weeks before he passed away. Ted had severe frostbite and was missing some of his toes. He had severe gangrene on his feet. Something others believe is the biggest mystery in this case, but I believe there is a reasonable explanation for this, is that the trailer had access to heat. There was a propane tank outside that connected to the trailer. All they had to do was turn the valve on. Ted would not have frozen to death if this was turned on. There were also matches, wooden furniture, and plenty of paperback books and items that could have been burned in order to start a fire, but none of it was touched. There was a locker outside that had cans of food, tons of them. The locker had been broken into by someone filing the lock. 31 empty cans of food were found in the trailer, so we know that these were consumed. Next to the locker was a second locker that contained enough food for all five men to survive on for one year, but it was untouched, along with military-style wool blankets and other things to keep warm. I know it's odd, but in my opinion, and yes, I could be wrong, 
I agree with those who believe that we don't know if they are capable of knowing how to turn the propane all on. This may be beyond their abilities. They may not know if they go outside and flip this switch that the trailer will have heat. As for the ton of food remaining untouched, Ted's family believes the reason for this is because Ted would have thought it wasn't okay to take. He would be afraid he'd be stealing or would get in trouble. Ted was taught not to take things that don't belong to him, and he would take that literally and would starve to death before he's going to do something he wasn't supposed to. We know Gary's shoes were found inside the trailer, so there's a good probability that he was there at some point, but Ted's shoes are missing. It's possible that Gary was having frostbite and his feet were swelling. Ted had bigger feet than Gary did. Once Ted passed away, Gary put on Ted's shoes and left. It's possible all of them were there, and once Ted passed, they left. They weren't going to stay in a trailer with their friend's body. Plus, we know Ted was carefully wrapped in sheets. Someone was taking care of him at the end. An immediate 40-person search of the area to try to locate the others is taking place. On June 6, 1978, this is two days after Ted's body was discovered in the trailer, around one and a half miles from the trailer, searchers find the body of Jack Madruga. He was 30 years old. Jack was the driver the night they disappeared. Jack's remains are badly decomposed, and he was partially eaten by animals. His watch was folded up in his hand. The keys to his prized Mercury Montego were in his pocket. He was found partially submerged in a stream, and it's believed his body was drugged there by animals. Across the road on an embankment, the remains of Bill Sterling were found. He was 29 years old. His bones were scattered around in a 50-yard area in the woods. His wallet was found, and it contained his identification. At this point, we have three out of the five boys located. We are still missing Jackie Hewitt and Gary Mathias. Jackie, remember, was the youngest at just 24 years old. His dad decides to join the search, even though police begged him not to. They told him, you may come across his body, and it would be traumatizing. But Jackie's father said no. He made a promise to his son that he was going to find him, and he was determined to do that. According to Strange Outdoors, two days after Jack and Bill's bodies were found, on the same road but closer to the trailer, Jackie Sr. was searching for his son. When he sees his son's jacket on the ground, along with the pair of Levi jeans he was wearing, trigger warning here, he picks up Jackie's jacket, and a spine falls out of it. He falls to his knees and cries and hugs his son's jacket. His skull was located 100 yards away. Dental records confirm that this was Jackie. He, like the others, had died from the elements. They keep searching for Gary Mathias, but after two weeks, the search was called off. We are left with so many questions, and we'll get into them, but first, where is Gary? Gary has never been located. Even today, in 2024, there's a huge split amongst people who know about this case. It seems like half of them believe Gary was the one responsible for this. The other half believe Gary was a victim too and that people are using his schizophrenia as a scapegoat for this whole case, which is why they stopped searching after Jackie's body was found. We know Gary was the one who was the newest to the group. He had no disabilities. However, he suffered with severe schizophrenia. Gary has a criminal history, which could have been attributed to the schizophrenia. He had arrests and charges of assault and once even punched a cop because he didn't want to be in the army anymore. He thought the best way to quickly get discharged was to punch a cop. This was all before he was taking medication. His, his symptoms have been controlled for the last two years, taking these heavy antipsychotics. He has to see a doctor multiple times a month and he gets evaluated. His doctor said he's doing great and he found a group of friends who accepted him and he loved playing on a basketball team with them. Why would he suddenly turn on his friends? The police check local psychiatric hospitals to see if Gary showed up to any of them since he would need help right away being away from his medications. They also check jails, hospitals, homeless shelters, and there's no one that's seen him. 
My issue is that if Gary survived all of this and is out on his own, I feel like someone would notice him. He was known when not medicated to be a very aggressive person who starts fights and made a scene everywhere he went. It's been speculated that maybe Gary didn't take his medication that day because he wanted to have more energy for the basketball game the next morning. If he didn't take it, who knows what he's capable of. But his stepfather confirmed that he was the one who administered Gary's medication to him every morning like clockwork. This was so that they would know he was taking it and not missing any doses. I know I keep focusing on Gary's medicine, but I'm reminded of a case I brought you a while back. Tim McLean and Vincent Lee. Vincent Lee had untreated schizophrenia. He killed a random man on a bus and began eating him in front of everybody. He was later released back to the public and is as free as you and I are today. As long as he's taking his medicine, he's a perfect citizen, according to the judge and his doctors. If he misses a dose, he's capable of murder and cannibalism. I don't know if Gary was at this level of illness that Vincent was at, but if so, he's capable of some serious shit. Why did these boys leave the game in Chico and instead of driving the straight route back to Yuba City, they ventured way off the path and went 70 miles out of the way and up a snowy mountain in a national forest? Jack Madruga's mother Mabel said, There was some force that made them go up there. They wouldn't have fled off in the woods like a bunch of quail. We know good and well that somebody made them do it. We can't visualize someone getting the upper hand on those five men, but we know it must have been that. They seen something at the game in the parking lot. They might have seen it and didn't even realize it. It seemed like things were normal up until they left the store after purchasing snacks. Something happened once they left that store. Let's go over some of the theories. There's literally hundreds out there, but we'll talk about the most popular ones. Was it possible someone at the game or a local person followed them after they left? In the 1970s, mentally challenged folks were highly stigmatized and were seven times more likely to be a victim of violence. Even the newspaper articles about the missing boys read headlines like, Five retarded men vanished without a trace. Sometimes the simplest theories are the most likely. Some believe the men got sugared up from all the candy bars and sodas they drank and became manic and energetic. They go the wrong way, get lost, and get their car stuck. They start trudging through the woods but get more lost the further they continue. But why go uphill? Why not walk back down? Is it possible that Gary was exhibiting schizophrenia and forced Jack to drive in the wrong direction? Then he made him walk up the mountain. It causes hallucinations and delusions. He may have forced them out thinking that he was saving them from something he saw. Many feel that Gary told the others they were being followed by a bad person, and he truly believed that they were. He may have told Jack, drive, just go, turn here, now turn right. They race up the mountain and get stuck. Then they hear a guy moaning and yelling he needs help, and that scares them even more. Remember, when the guy yells, they turn their headlights off and stay quiet. This is what someone would do who is scared. Then they panic and take off. They make it to the cabin, and Gary tells them not to light any fires or anything because it would draw attention to whoever is chasing them. They weren't found with injuries. If Gary or someone else did this to them, he would have had to make them go to the trailer, and then he would be in charge of the food rations, and they ultimately starved and died of hypothermia. Ted didn't have any inflicted injuries that the medical examiner could find. I imagine the other three would be hard to tell if they had injuries since animals had already gotten to their bodies. They were mostly just bones. But we know the boys died slow, agonizing deaths. They were starving to death while dealing with hypothermia. Ted lost multiple toes due to frostbite. We don't know if the others did because their remains were not intact like Ted's was. The boys' families say even though Gary was new to the group, he was the leader. The families weren't crazy about him, and they didn't know about his criminal record. He didn't exhibit the same innocence that the others did, and it's rumored that some of the boys were afraid of Gary and didn't want him going to the game that night. Even the Gateway Gators basketball coach said that although Gary was heavily medicated, he appeared that he could flip a switch at any time. 
But Gary's family says Gary would not have harmed his friends. He loved those guys. They say Gary is just as much a victim as the rest of them were. They believe Gary is no longer alive and that he died alongside the others. His remains were just not found. His sister said, I do believe he didn't make it out of there any more than the other boys did. I'm really torn because I don't know what to believe. I honestly have no idea. Was Gary Mathias responsible for his friend's death? Has he been in hiding all these years? If he came out of this ordeal alive, I feel like he wouldn't be able to stay out of trouble for very long. The Sacramento Bee summed it up perfectly because they were allowed to view all of the police reports, photos, and items relating to the case as long as they weren't copied or photographed. So they did a piece about the Yuba County Five, and in it they said, These clips, files, and interviews shape a disturbing image of Gary. Billed in virtually all media reports at the time as another lost lamb, lost out in the cold, Gary was an aberration within the flock, a young man who did not belong with the others. He was violently schizophrenic and had a history of drug use and wasn't intellectually disabled like the others. Something important that stood out to me was that Jack Madruga's niece, Kathy, told Files of the Unexplained that around a year after the bodies were found, she went into a bar and was shocked to see Gary Mathias sitting at the bar. He made eye contact with her and then bolted. That's her story, and I can't add anything else to it. I can't find if any other suspects or persons of interest were named in this case. According to Benji Eggle for the Sacramento Bay, three weeks after the boys went missing, a woman named Debbie Reese, who was a totally random Yuba County citizen, received an anonymous phone call. The caller was a man who said, I know where those missing five men are. Then he hung up. Debbie calls the police and lets them know that she just got some weird random call and what the person said. The next day, she gets another call from the same man. She says hello, and he responds, I need help because I hurt those guys bad. When she asks, who did you hurt? He, re- he replied, don't play dumb with me, and hung up. The next day, her phone rang again. All he said this time was, those five guys are all dead. Sheriff Beecham doesn't believe it was Gary Mathias making that phone call. He also said, I have a total of 50 years in law enforcement. It's a case that never lost my thought. I often think back to that case. I very much regret that we weren't able to find those children. And yes, they were children. But I'm also convinced that we did everything in our power to locate them and find out what happened. Lieutenant Lance Ayers of the Yuba County Sheriff's Office, who is the first one that put out the nationwide bulletin about the missing boys, died in June of 2010. Rest in peace to these boys, Jackie Hewitt, Bill Sterling, Ted Ware, and Jack Madruga. I don't know if Gary Mathias is alive or not, so I don't want to give him a rest in peace. It's been 46 years, and we still don't know what happened to the Yuba County Five. I don't know if this will ever be solved. Most of the police officers and parents of the victims are all dead now, but the world is still looking for answers on their behalf. That's it for this week, and I'll see you all again soon. Take care, and much love to you all. Intro music is Feral Angel Waltz, which is composed by Kevin McLeod, licensed under Creative Commons. All his music can be found on his website, incompetech.com.